This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at microbeworld.org slash twim. This Week in Microbiology. This is a special episode recorded on December 3rd, 2014. Hey, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to TWIM, the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. We have a guest here at Columbia today, and I thought it would be useful to grab him into my office for an hour or so uh, and record a conversation. And he's a professor at the University of Colorado in Boulder, Rob Knight. Welcome, Rob. Uh, thanks, Vincent. And you're going to be moving, right? Uh, yeah, that's right. So uh, in, in January, we're starting a new microbiome initiative at UCSD. And uh, so, uh, so so it's uh, incredibly exciting, and I'm nice. looking forward to the move. I was just out in San Diego twice in the past month. One of the visits was at the Salk, which is right across from where you'll be, I presume, right? Uh -huh. Yeah, that's right. You'll like it because the weather's very nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I grew up in Dunedin in the South Island of New Zealand, uh -huh. which was settled by the Scots, so that tells you everything you need to know about the climate, mm. and uh, the climate in San Diego was the polar opposite of that, so yeah. I'm looking forward to that change. And of course, Boulder has a wintry type of climate, right? You have a summer and a winter, and it gets cold and snows and all that. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it's uh, it, it's pretty sunny there as well, uh, yeah. about 300 days a are you, year. Are but, you going to miss Boulder? Um, yeah, I'll miss Boulder. There's a lot of great people there. Uh, yeah. it's, a, it's a beautiful place. Um, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of exciting stuff going on. Um, the what, what's what's really uh, what, what's really exciting about uh, about the new microbiome initiative is, is really the ability to com combine uh, uh, combine work on microbial genomics with mm -hmm. metabolomics, so we can get it function as well. Right. Uh, uh, be able to put things in germ-free mice and having really good clinical mm -hmm. access, so we can get samples from a lot of uh, a lot of different patients. So I want to start by just exploring uh, your background. You, you're from New Zealand, and uh, tell us, uh, you went to college in New Zealand? Uh, yeah, so I did my undergrad in biochemistry at the University of Otago. Mm -hmm. We have some listeners from New Zealand, as cool. you might guess, you know, for, for all of our podcasts. It's always, it's always amusing when they write, because I always think it's so far away. How could anyone listen to a podcast? But of course, it doesn't matter. <laughs> sure, exactly. <laughs> when did you come to the U.S.? Um, in, uh, in 1996 for grad school. PhD. Yeah, that's right. And where did you go? Uh, so I worked with Laura Landweber at Princeton. Oh, you must know her brother. He used to program for the Mac, right? Yeah, uh, yeah Greg Landweber uh, yeah. used a lot of the software. Uh, yeah. yeah. So in fact, I, I knew him long before I, I knew Laura. It's uh -huh. funny because I had used his software in the early Mac days. You know, everyone kind of was in the same community and <laughs> it's yeah, really exactly. funny. So you came and you were, you know, it's funny. I saw, I read an article that said you were at Princeton. And I said, I have to ask him if he knows Laura. So he actually worked in her lab. All right. And uh, what did you do there? Uh, mostly I was working on the evolution of the genetic code. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was, um, most of the time I spent was on lab work, selecting RNA sequences that combine to different amino acids. Okay. Although uh, most of what I published was computational analysis, looking at uh, looking at sequences of uh, those kinds of RNA aptamers, also uh, also genome sequences, trying to figure out how different parts of the translation apparatus could evolve. So you were doing a computational project mainly, but um, you, some selection, obviously, that's biochemistry, right? Yeah. So, so as I said, I spent most of my time uh, on the biochemistry okay. side of it, but then most of the productivity came from the computational side. So, how did you get from New Zealand to? Princeton. How did you decide to go there? Uh, well, well, actually, I, um, I, I had a very focused project, as mm -hmm. uh, so many people do when they um, when, when they start grad school. So I was actually going to work on, on pest control. And uh, in New Zealand, we have a tremendous problem with with introduced mammalian pests. So, uh, and uh, for example, possums are a, uh, are, are a particular. When you say introduced. Uh, um, int int introduced from Australia. Because uh, they have the their own problems with introduced pests, right? Yeah, that's right. So, uh, <laughs> so, so Australia has problems with eutherian mammals, right, that were, right. That, that were introduced. New Zealand has all those eutherian mammal problems and problems mm. with marsupials introduced from Australia. So, uh, you know, you split off earlier, so you have more time to diverge and uh, more time for everything yeah. to adapt to uh, the, the absence of those, uh, of those species. So, so when, I was, um, when I was still in high school, it must have been either from the extended gene, uh, sorry, from the selfish gene or the extended phenotype, uh, but one, one of Richard Dawkins' books mm. um, mentioned, uh, mentioned this phenomenon of selfish genes. So uh, 
uh, so um, segregation distorters, and the idea that if you had one of those on a sex chromosome, that that might drive populations mm -hmm. extinct very rapidly. And so uh, what, what I wondered was whether this might be possible to apply a mammalian pace. And so, uh, so I got a travel grant in 1995 to visit Lee Silver to explore the feasibility of that mm -hmm. project. And, uh, and, and he said, well, uh, why, why don't, so instead of trying to do that in New Zealand, um, and write a grant for it and get support and so on. Uh, why, why, didn't, why, why didn't you come to grad school at Princeton and uh, you could work on it for your thesis project? Mm. So that, that sounded like an amazing opportunity. And, um, and, and so I got there, and then uh, a year after I got there, uh, another lab did it. So, so, Lee, Lee was the, um, so, so, so Lee had done a huge amount of work on the T haplotype, which is the best characterized meiotic, uh, meiotic drive complex in mammals. And uh, so, so the issue was, a year after I got there, uh, another lab did a knockout of, of the putative responder locus and found no phenotype. Mm. And so uh, ha having, having a project where I could spend, uh, you know, another 15 years tracking down the right gene, and then I could start didn't mm. seem especially promising. <laughs> so, um, uh, so, so, uh, so I wound up switching labs and switching projects yeah. and, uh, and in into something else that worked out pretty well. But uh, yeah, it's always important. Um, so one, one thing I always tell grad students now is, uh, you know, no matter, no matter how convinced you are when you're coming into a lot, uh, coming into a PhD program that you know exactly how it's going to turn out. It's just not the case for most people. And so finding a program where there's multiple people you could work with is really good. So you don't have any problem with going in with a mind that you might switch a, a lab? Uh, no, no problem at all. And in fact, I think, uh, I think programs that have a rotation system have, have tremendous advantages. Mm. Um, so, uh, so, so at Boulder, there's some programs like uh, molecular biology and, um, and uh, biochemistry where the students must do rotations. Uh, and then there's other, there's other programs like, uh, like ecology and evolutionary biology right. uh, that, that don't have those rotation opportunities. And uh, the number of people who discover something that they never expected they'd be interested in, but, but that really becomes their passion during their rotations is really large. Absolutely. And, and it works both <laughs> ways, right? So there are people who, who go there convinced <laughs> they want to work with me, and then um, you know, they try out a few different labs, and it turns out that what they're really interested in is, is signaling or X-ray crystallography mm -hmm. instead, which is completely fine. And then correspondingly, you've got people who've never thought about uh, microbes in their life. And uh, it, it turns out that what they really want to do is uh, figure out, say, how microbes make you fat or uh, uh, lead to autism or uh, yeah. all kinds of things yeah. like that. And so, so just having that flexibility is tremendously valuable. Yeah, I've seen that here as well. People come in with incredibly specific ideas and then they do something completely the opposite. And that, that's good. It means it's working, right? Absolutely. I mean, the whole point of grad school is to learn things, and yeah. if you knew everything when you when you started, you wouldn't be taking full advantage yeah. of it. So you were in Princeton from what what year to uh, ninety six to two thousand one. I have a long history with Princeton. I wrote a book, uh, several editions of a of a virology book with people at Princeton, including uh, Lynn Enquist and Jane Flint. All right, sure. Yep. You must know, and then I know also other people there, like Tom Shank and Bonnie Bassler. You must know. Uh -huh, yeah. Right. Did you interact with with any of them at the um, time? Yeah, a, a fair amount. So, uh, so, so Laura was um, was uh, cross listed between ecology and evolution and molecular biology. Okay. And so, uh, you know, the lab would go to the molecular biology retreats as well, and that mm, kind of thing. Yeah. So, uh, so, so I had a fair bit of contact with the molecular biologists. Terrific, terrific departments, both of them. Big departments too which is different from what we have here. Now, a lot of your work involves computational aspects, and is that I, I get the impression that's, that's something you're really good at. So if that's correct, um, where did you pick that up? Um, well, uh, so, so I'd, I'd always been interested in, in computers as mm -hmm. a kid, although... Uh, although when when I got to college, so at um, so so the first year I, I had a fair amount of flexibility in uh, what courses uh, I, I could take. So um, so I took the introductory programming course, which was in Pascal, uh, which certainly mm. dates it a fair bit. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and like the mathematical statistics course, and um, and uh, you go into biochemistry in your in your second year, and uh, and so I, I had a meeting with the chair after my first year and said, uh, you know, um, I, I really enjoyed the programming course I took. Uh, I, I survived the mathematical statistics course. Uh, you know, I was wondering about, should I do more of that uh, to, to go on in biochemistry? 
And, and he looked at me and said, oh, no, 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 no. You see, there's absolutely no career future in combining biochemistry with computer science. No, you should, you should do something useful like, uh, like more chemistry and physiology and, uh, and psychology and so on. And so, so, so I believed him and I, I uh, you know, took, um, took courses and all of those things. And uh, it really wasn't, until, hmm. uh, really wasn't until I was in grad school and uh, we were trying to we were trying to do sequence alignments in Microsoft Word, you know, coloring the different residues with search and replace, mm. and putting in the hyphens by hand and stuff. And uh, it, it was just completely clear to me that uh, that, that, that doing that uh, do, doing that by hand rather than uh, writing software to automate it uh, was was completely crazy. Mm. Uh, and and so. Um, so, so what, what happened then is I, uh, I, I split my time uh, initially uh, about equally between lab work and, uh, and, and computation, and then uh, as, 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 as time progressed, it, it became clear to me that uh, you know, I could never compete with some of the really high, uh, highly skilled technicians, mm -hmm. um, especially Mike Harris's lab, like, uh, uh, like Marley Lange Sakari and uh, Irene Meyerfeld and so on. Um, uh, in, in terms of uh, in terms of being able to do the selections, but uh, that there was this huge niche for being able to automate repetitive tasks, uh, apply better statistical approaches to sequence data, mm -hmm. and and so on. And that was something that I could uh, pick up a lot more efficiently and uh, re really have more of an impact in. So. Um, so, so by the time I finished my uh, by the time I finished my PhD, mm -hmm. uh, I was mostly doing computation and statistics, and uh, I, um, and and the lab work really trailed off at that point. Was that still in Pascal, or had you switched to, to Python by then? Oh, um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so, so it certainly wasn't Pascal anymore. So, mm -hmm. uh, so Steve Freeland. Um, joined the lab in uh, in 1998, I guess it was, from Lawrence Hurst's lab uh, at, at at Cambridge, and um, and and so uh, and and so he he really um, he, he really transformed my attitude towards uh, computation by uh, by by uh, really reinforcing how important it was not mm. just to have a fancy algorithm. But uh, also to have a user interface that went along with it and made yeah, it accessible. Yeah. So, um, so the technologies that he was focused on were, was a combination of C for the uh, computation, um, and then Visual Basic, which let you tie into existing interfaces like Microsoft mm -hmm. Word, Microsoft Excel, and so on that everyone used. And um, probably, probably the software I wrote that saved people most time uh, was was this toolbar, where basically what it was, so, so the the sequencing that we did at the time. Um, you got your sequences back from the facility one at a, one at a time, and mm -hmm. each sequence was in its own sequence file. And so, uh, and, and then the file name was what had the name of the sequence in it. Mm -hmm. So to convert that into something that you could use in an alignment, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you had to open every file, copy it, paste it into uh, paste it into a text editor, and then you had to type in the name or copy and paste the name from uh, opening it up in the finder. So, so it was just a little script where there was this button um, uh, in, in one of the word toolbars that you would. Press and you just pointed at your uh, mm -hmm. pointed at your folder of sequences and it would suck them all nice. in and reformat yeah. them into into uh, fast day format so that you could actually use them and so so it took <laughs> this so so you know instead of dreading getting the sequence data back and you got it back and then you'd procrastinate for weeks before you actually looked at it now you could just hit a button and in a second uh, you were ready mm -hmm. to go and ready to analyze it. I have to tell you my experience. So as a postdoc. I sequenced uh, polio genome at MIT. It was the first animal virus. We had cloned it, and we did Maxim Gilbert. All right. It took me one year to do the whole genome, 7,400 bases, 2X, both strands, wow. <laughs> 2X coverage. And what I would do, I, I would read each gel manually, uh -huh. write down the runs, uh -huh. and then when I had them all, I would, put the, I would dial up the MIT computer, which was running Multics. Uh-huh. I would put the telephone in the acoustic coupler and then type in the sequences on a terminal. And there was a program that would overlap them. It may have been Staden, I don't remember at the time. And eventually you would get your contigs and print them out. And you could only do manipulate one sequence at a time. Right, sure. Right? And it would print it out. I'd have to go somewhere else in another building to get the print out. And oh, it was just so hard to do anything. Yeah, that's <laughs> amazing. And even 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 between um, sequencing gels and uh, and uh, uh, using uh, using capillary sequencing, um, uh, you know, it, uh, it, it seemed it seemed like a huge advance at the time, but. Uh uh, often, although not today, I, I, I talk about the, um, the the first paper we did with uh, with Jeff Gordon on microbes mm -hmm. and obesity uh, back in two thousand five. 
uh, the, the, the Dark Ages, and you know we had five thousand eighty eight sequences that came out of the came out of the mouse gut, mm -hmm. and uh, and so the problem was how do, how do you deal with such a massive data set of five thousand sequences, right, right. and uh, you know today it's it's in the rounding error probably the rounding error per sample if you did your sequencing on on, on Illumina or something. And it's just remarkable that you know we have these instruments now where every time you run them, you get a billion sequences. So that's that's the big change. When I was first starting, you did one genome, one viral genome, and you, people just worked on it. You never thought of doing communities at all because you didn't have the power to to analyze them. Right. So so that's so then you moved to Boulder as a, a postdoc, correct? Right. And, and who did you work with there? So I worked with Mike Yaris. Uh, um, so, so, so I was continuing the work on the evolution of the genetic code mm -hmm. and then um, branching out from there, looking at structure-function relationships in RNA and uh, trying to understand how many RNA sequences you'd need to search through before you found one that did something interesting like catalyzed mm -hmm. reaction or bound to a target. Okay, and then you stayed on in, in, as a faculty member. And you've been there ever since, correct? Yeah, that's right. So, um, so the the Biofrontiers Institute, which is this um, interdisciplinary institute to bring together people in biology, computer science, mm -hmm. uh, math, engineering. Um, so, so it started in two thousand four, and uh, I was the first faculty member hired there. So, when you started your lab, were you continuing your postdoc work? Essentially, um, no. I was I was strictly advised that doing anything <laughs> that continued my uh, my postdoctoral work would be a would would be a huge career disaster, yeah. and I and I should change fields entirely. And so, um, and so, what I settled on, and and this is probably going to make you laugh as well. Uh, what, what what I settled on was type three secretion. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, and and, and so uh, you know, for, for so, so the, the the concept of the project, um, I, I still think is pretty good. Basically, we were going to find additional type three secreted effectors mm -hmm. in Salmonella using a combination of proteomics and uh, microarrays uh, with with expression time courses and uh, uh, scans of the whole genome for horizontal gene transfer and uh, phylogenetic reconstruction mm -hmm. to look for uh, genes uh, look, look for genes that um, migrated into the genome phylogenetically at about the time at the same time as the type three secretion apparatus, and then separate out spy one and spy two effectors and uh, looking at targeting sequences. Mm -hmm. So, um, so we worked really hard on that uh, for for about three years and um, uh, uh, just just trying to just trying to make some headway. And um, and uh, Kathy Lozapone actually, who uh, who was also uh, also in Laurel Land Weber's lab as a technician, and then moved out to Colorado to work for Infomax, but then they shut down the Colorado site, and she decided to uh, decided to work at the university uh, for a while and then go into grad school. So she joined my lab to work on the type three secretion project because she was really good at culturing all sorts of other mm -hmm. organisms, ranging from uh, ciliates to uh, chytrid fungi to um, so you know Salmonella should have been easy. And um, after so, so after after bashing away at the project for a while. Uh, she said, "You know, I, I'm just not really that interested in this type three secretion project, and I, I'd, I'd rather do something involving uh, computers and phylogenies and sequence analysis. And um, uh, what, what about uh, what, what about that project looking at community differences uh, that, that I started on for my rotation? Could I do more of that?" And I said, "Well, uh, I, I'm not going to stop you from doing what you're really passionate about, but uh, you know, where the lab's going is very much type three secretion. That's what I'm writing all these grants about. It's what I'm spending all my startup on, and." Uh, you, you might, you know, I, I, I just want to uh, make sure that you're aware of the risks that, uh, that, that you know, a few years from now, uh, we might have some, um, uh, some, some really important paper in a, uh, in a, in a top tier journal um, uh, about, uh, about type three secretion, and you might, you might feel <laughs> that it was a, a lost opportunity. And uh, so, you know, what, what she, uh, what, what she did instead was develop Unifrag, which, um, ah. uh, which has, uh, you know, has now been cited. Uh, uh, has, has now been cited over a thousand times, and uh, we, we never published anything on type three secretion ever. <laughs> what uh, a story! That's terrific. So uh, yeah, <laughs> so, so she got you interested as well in the what she was doing then, right? Yeah, precisely, and it, it just it just really reinforces how important it is to uh, to listen to your students and let them follow sure. what they're really passionate sure. about, rather than necessarily assuming that uh, you can predict what the right directions are. But it was interesting because um, you know at the at the time uh, I, I was really frustrated about you know all the type three secretion grants mm -hmm. that, uh, that, that, uh, that I was writing that, uh, that, that never never got funded. But in retrospect, um, you know, after you've been on study section a few times, uh, you know, if I go back and look at those grants, I now, uh, I, I now realize yeah. what the reviewers spotted that, um, that made it an adequate project, but not a great project, uh, like, sure. like some of the other things that we went on to do instead.
So Unifrac is a program that allows you to take many sequences and, and categorize them and, and show how, how similar or different they are, essentially? Is that fair? Um, that, that's not, um, what, what Unifrac does is it does, uh, it's a distance metric for comparing entire microbial communities. Okay. And the way we compare the microbial communities is in terms of the evolutionary history uh, that, that separates mm -hmm. them uniquely. So Unifrac stands for unique fraction. You're looking at the fraction of the phylogenetic tree that's unique to one sample or the other out of a pair of samples. And, um, and so the reason why it's important is it lets you, uh, it lets you take any, uh, it lets you exploit Darwin's insight that there, there's this one universal tree of life that connects mm -hmm. all organisms, right? So you can take biological samples from anywhere, map the organisms that are in those samples onto that one universal tree, and then measure the distance between them in terms right. of the separated okay. evolutionary history. And so this was needed because you were starting to deal with many sequences, right? Yes, that's exactly right. And we wanted to deal with them at the whole community level. Right. And so uh, what, what motivated it was uh, one, one of Norm's postdocs had five samples. Norm Pace, uh, right? Uh, Norm, Norm Pace, yeah. Uh, he's, uh, he's, he's at Boulder in the Molecular uh, Cellular and Deve uh, Developmental Biology Department. So, so he, had, he had five samples, and Andy Martin in the Ecology and Evolutionary Biology Department mm -hmm. had developed this test called the P-test, or uh, phylogenetic test. So it was a very elegant way of using the phylogenetic tree to ask uh, our, two, our two communities communities um, statistically uh, distinguishable or not. And so the way it does it is it builds a phylogeny, um, it labels the states of the two communities on, on the tips, and then it infers all the ancestral sequences. Um, and then, then, uh, then what it does is it randomizes the association between each sample and, uh, and, and the tip. So mm -hmm. you just randomly uh, reassign the tips as though you found them in the other environment. And, and when you do the phylogenetic reconstruction, you ask by parsimony how many changes are there from the root uh, throughout the whole tree. And, um, and so the idea uh, the idea is that if the communities are the same, then, mm -hmm. uh, you, then, then you get the same result by chance that you do in the actual tree. Whereas if the communities are distinct and there's unique evolutionary history, you should see fewer changes. So we had this five by five matrix and all of the communities were significantly different from each other, P less than 0 0.001. And, and, and so, so the problem was, well, where do you go from there if all the communities are different? And, um, and, and the issue is that if you have a lot of communities to compare, you don't really care which ones are different from each other because, let's face it, they're all going to be different. Like you, the community on your index finger is going to be different from the community on your middle finger and, and, and so forth. Uh, what, what you care about is how, how similar or how different are the communities in terms of the phylogenetic tree. So what Unifrac does mm -hmm. is it solves that problem. Okay, and this, and the program will take any sequence, or is it meant for 16S ribosomal RNA sequences? Um, no, in fact, Unifrac itself doesn't even look at the sequences. So Unifrac, no. uh, Unifrac takes a tree and uh, a set of associations between environments and leaves of the tree, mm -hmm. and then there's a weighted version of it that also takes account of, uh, of, of each sequence, sorry, of each tip and each environment into account. Okay. And so, so typically, uh, the way we use it is we derive the tree from the sequences, and we use accounts of the sequences as leaves on the tree. But as long as, long as you have a tree, and you have associations between the tree and environmental states um, where the environments could be, uh, you know, uh, like samples out there in the ocean. Mm -hmm. They could be samples in there uh, in, in your gut. Uh, it's completely agnostic to that. Uh, all, all it does is asks, is there a relationship, uh, you know, uh, what, what is the relationship uh, right. between the different environmental samples in terms of the parts of the tree they cover? So how do you generate the tree in the first place if you have many, many sequences? Um, well, well so, this, uh, so, so what we're currently using is um, a, a program developed by Morgan Price at LBNL called FastTree. Uh, and um, so, so FastTree is an approximation to likelihood that uses, uh, uses profiles on the interior nodes and uh, it can handle data sets of up to a few hundred thousand sequences. So, so then the problem is how do you go from millions of sequences mm. to, uh, to a few hundred thousand that you can make a tree out of? Um, what, what you typically have to do is you have to cluster them into operational taxonomic units. So essentially you're defining clusters of sequences uh, according to sequence similarity between mm. each pair of those sequences. Um, then, then what you do is you just take a representative from each of those sets of sequences and uh, build the backbone tree with that. And then you can uh, then you can take the sequences in each OTU and do final resolution phylogenies of just okay. the sequences in each of those. Okay. Decompose the problem. So, so Unifrac was used in the first uh, collaboration with Jeff Gordon, the Obesity Project, right? How did that come about? Correct. Well, well, how, how it came <laughs> about was uh, Ruth Lay had actually uh, been in non paces lab at the time that we started mm -hmm. having discussions about, you know, how would you compare whole microbial communities at the uh, at the level of uh, phylogenetic differences and so um, so so her uh, her husband Lars 
uh, got a faculty position at WashU, and so uh, that meant that mm. she was moving to WashU as well, and uh, uh, Jeff offered her a position as a postdoc in his, uh, in, in his lab. And, uh, and, and he basically told her, okay, uh, you, you do environmental microbiology with 16S, here's 5,000 16S sequences, how, how do you like that? Mm. And, um, and, and, so, uh, and, and so she was um, intrigued, but that was a lot of data to deal with, and so, uh, especially in terms of doing the community yeah. comparisons. So, uh, she, um, so, so she got in touch with, uh, with, with Kathy and me, remembering that we were interested in that kind of thing, and uh, really that's how the collaboration got started. And that was comparing gut microbiota in obese and non-obese mice, basically, right? Yeah, that's correct. So it was the uh, it was the OBOB uh, leptin mutant model, and so it was looking at uh, so, so it was looking at litter mates from uh, from mating two heterozygotes. So you had homozygous uh, mutant heterozygotes and homozygous wild type, and so so the reason it's really important to look at litter mates is that there's very large cage effects in the microbiome. Mm. Uh, we we didn't really know that at that time, but uh, uh, in, in subsequent studies, even the same genetic strain of mouse from different uh, different vendors can have uh, totally different communities, as uh, uh, as um, uh, Dan Lippman and people in his lab showed a few yeah, years right. ago. Actually, his oh, Evo, Evo, Evo is here. here. That's right. I, yes. I had a great conversation with oh, him. Oh, you met him. Good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. His, his, his bacteria is not present in, in certain kinds of commercial mice, yeah. Yeah, it was really a pleasure to meet him after uh, reading reading a whole bunch of uh, yeah. uh, those papers that he yeah, did, We to. did a twin with him a couple of years ago. That's cool. As soon, in the early days when he had just come here, but now it's progressing really, really cool to cool ways and just amazing. So um, since then, this whole, I guess that was the first indication that two disease states or a disease state would have an altered microbiome. Is that correct? Um, I think so. I, I, I mean, apart from, apart from obvious yeah. cases of infectious disease sure, where, you have sure. a, where, where you have a pathogen, um, I, I think I think it's fair to say that right. it was the first association of disease state with. And I think that really catalyzed a whole new field where people are looking at uh, bacterial communities and people and trying to figure out uh, their relationship. And I guess a big part of this has been the Human Microbiome Project. Did that come up after the Gordon experiments? Yeah, that's right. So uh, so what what happened after that? Uh, is um, is, is uh, uh, Jeff together with uh, a, a number of other uh, a number of other uh, senior people mm. in the field approached NIH about uh, about doing a larger scale project and wrote a white paper. So this um, mm. this paper in, in Nature in two thousand seven that uh, that, that uh, Jeff and Claire Fraser uh, and I and then uh, Pete Turnbow, uh, who was then a graduate student in, in Jeff's lab and is now a faculty member at uh, UCSF was the was the first author on that paper, sort of uh, delineating uh, how, how you might accomplish a human mm -hmm. microbiome project. Uh, af after that, there was a meeting at Banbury at the start of 2008 uh, that, that really, uh, w which was really exciting because it got together medical microbiologists mm -hmm. and sequencing center people and uh, microbial ecologists to, uh, again, to talk about the structure of the project. So, um, so then, so, so then uh, the Human Microbiome Project itself, uh, the, the, there's a whole lot of different components to it. So there was a jump start, uh, which was basically the sequencing centers looking at the healthy uh, characterization of the healthy human microbiome. And mm -hmm. uh, then there were a bunch of technology development projects, uh, tool development projects um, uh, for, uh, for lab methods as well as for, uh, for sequencing methods. Uh, there were demonstration mm -hmm. projects to link the microbiome to a, to a bunch of different diseases. There was a data analysis and coordination center. And then there was an LC component to look at the uh, ethical, legal, and social implications. Mm -hmm. Were you involved in some of these? Uh, yeah, so, um, so so I had one of the new tools grants, uh, wh which is basically where Chime came from, uh, together with uh, funding from the Gates Foundation and the CCFA. Um, there was uh, um, uh, we were part of the we were part of the DAC, and uh, also I was uh, collaborating on a, on several of the demo projects. Okay, and this is only possible because of high throughput sequencing that had been developed, right? Yeah, that's way a, beyond the Sanger and the Maxim Gilbert days of mine. Yeah, that, that's exactly <laughs> right. Uh, and um, and the, the the high throughput sequencing. Um, how 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 I found out about that was actually at the uh, National Academy Keck Futures Initiative meeting in two thousand five. Mm -hmm. So um, so I, I was I was there uh, talking about the horizontal gene transfer work uh, in support of the type three secretion project, and um, and uh, Rick Bushman. 
uh, at uh, his at Penn uh, at, at head of the same meeting, and he'd just written a book on horizontal gene transfers. Mm -hmm. So we, we started talking about that topic, and uh, then 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 I told him about some of these other projects, like uh, like Unifrac, for example, and he said, "Well, um, suppose suppose I had a hundred thousand ribosomal RNA sequences. <laughs> uh, could uh, do you think you could make a tree out of them?" And I said, "Well, uh, yeah, I think I think we could probably do that. We'd do some data simplification. We'd run it through XML, but uh, we'd, we'd need to run it on a fairly large cluster." But, but I think we can probably do it on Hemisphere. Then he said, uh, there's a catch. The sequences are only 100 bases long. Uh, do, you, do, you think you can build a, uh, do you think you can build a good tree out of that? And I said, no, I can only, I can only build a terrible tree out of that. <laughs> but, uh, but the question is, is the tree good enough to be useful? Because, uh, because most of the resolutions are going to come from the intermediate branches uh, because the ones out at the tips don't have enough diversity to make much of a difference. And then uh, reconstruction of the deep branches doesn't, uh, doesn't matter all that mm -hmm. much uh, because, uh, because the internode distances are so short that you don't get a lot of resolution there either. So, uh, you know, let's try it out and see if it works. So that, that was what ultimately became uh, the, the paper on the rhesus macaques, uh, looking at SIV uh, infected macaques versus controls. And, um, and so the frustrating thing about that is that we did it initially on the, um, uh, we, so, so we, did, we, we did that initially on, on the uh, GS20, the first 454 platform, and mm -hmm. the reviewers just categorically refused to believe the results, so we had to redo all the sequencing on Flex after Flex came out, mm -hmm. uh, got exactly the same results, and yeah. uh, it just <laughs> took us an extra two years to wow. do, the additional, uh, do the additional data collection and software. So the, um, the Human Microbiome Project involved looking at communities in different parts of the body, right? Basically. Correct, yep. So, and you can find bacteria everywhere, on our surfaces, in our guts. Um, Where else can we find it? Lung, uh, lungs? Um, lungs? Lungs are very controversial. So, <laughs> uh, so um, you know, people with cystic fibrosis have a lot of bacteria in their lungs. Yeah. And the first, the, the first uh, barcoded pyro sequencing run we did with, with the error correcting codes, um, so this was with Jeff Walker and Kirk Harrison mm -hmm. uh, in, in non Pace's lab. Um, and uh, Micah Hamady, who was uh, a very talented grad student in my lab at the time, uh, and, and I basically figured out uh, how, how you would arrange the barcodes to uh, minimize the chance of error, and uh, if, if you had a sequencing error, correct the mm. mistake back to what it was supposed to be. Uh, so we could get very good resolution between the different samples. Um, basically, uh, yeah, so, so some of the first stuff we ran was Kirk Harris's project on, on cystic fibrosis lung and uh, looking at the different uh, different um, Pseudomonas and Burkholderia-dominated communities there. But normal lung is... Doesn't have these, um, but the normal lung, uh, the normal lung certainly doesn't have Pseudomonas okay. or, or Burkholderia. The, the issue is that there's a lot of antimicrobial peptides in the lung, yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and and so you can recover DNA sometimes. But then there's two problems. So one issue is that it might be dead DNA from live cells, mm -hmm. and the other problem is that you're getting right down into the background level of, of where you have DNA in your in your PCR mix yeah, and your DNA yeah. extraction kits and that kind of thing. Right. And so um, and, and so you're you're really you're really getting down to uh, yeah. contamination. Issues. So, like in the lung HIV microbiome project, uh, there, there was uh, there, there was a lot of uh, a lot of problem with the sampling and contamination of the lung samples with microbes from the airways, uh, where, okay. where you have much higher biomass. That was that was really an issue. Do, are you familiar with this one report? I think on a brain microbiome. Uh, yes. So um, I, I'm familiar with the report. Again. Um, the issue is that when you have heavily, when, when you have samples that are heavily contaminated with host DNA, uh, you, mm. you have to really go to extraordinary lengths to decontaminate all the reagents, and yeah. uh, and, and it's really difficult to draw conclusions. So um, anytime you see microbes reported from from a surprising environment, you really want to see replication of that study. Uh, and uh, yeah. and ideally, you want to see uh, differences in the microbes correlating with clinical state, um, or, or if it's an environmental mm. sample correlating with environmental state. And uh, until you have that, you want to be uh, you, you, you want you want to be cautious about the results. So basically, the places where there are microbes are on our surfaces or any yep. surfaces that are in contact with the environment, like the alimentary tract, right? Uh, yep, correct. Does the blood have a microbiome? Um, Again, uh, again, it's controversial. So, uh, so there's some evidence that even uh, that even people with no detectable bacteria may have uh, bacterial DNA circulating in the blood. 
um, with with that, there is some evidence that it correlates with clinical state. Mm. Um, so, uh, so 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 that's that that's starting to get very interesting. I understand again, when you brush when you brush your teeth, you get a transient bacteremia, right? Yes, that's correct. So maybe and, that's a study to do. <laughs> um, we, we we didn't we didn't do that directly, but we did do some work. Um, we, we did do some work with uh, Frederick Backied uh, in, um, in in Sweden, looking at the relationship between oral microbes and uh, atherosclerotic plaque. And uh, what, what's interesting is that the plaque microbes seem to uh, seem to match up to the oral microbes in the same person, right. and not to their fecal microbes, which uh, w- which is fascinating because uh, we we had previously thought that maybe it was translocation from the gut mm-hmm. that was uh, primarily leading to the systemic uh, okay. uh, bacteria. Okay. So so organs, heart, uh, liver, spleen, etc. They're not going to have a microbiome, probably, right? Um, Probably, although uh, so many things have been surprising in this field, mm. I wouldn't necessarily rule, rule it, it out, out categorically. Yeah. Okay. And um, so, so, for example, uh, for, for example, breast milk was um, was thought to be sterile, but it's pretty clear that there are microbes that are able to target themselves uh, systemically. To it was a report on urine microbiome recently, right? Uh-huh, yep. And uh, you know, in, in the Costello at our two thousand nine paper, we, um, we we collected. We, we collected urine with a couple mm-hmm. of different protocols, and um, we, we found essentially the same thing. But we were too chicken to put it in the paper because we thought <laughs> reviewers might, uh, you know, request us to do something like a like a needle biopsy. Yeah, and we were, yeah. there was no way we were going to get IRB permission to do that. Yeah. So we just left it out of the paper, and so so we were very happy to see those results uh, re- recaptured later. But several different groups have done it now in, in both males and females. So. Um, so, so, so it looks like the urethra uh, mm-hmm. pretty systematically does have a microbiome. So, what we have as adults is microbiomes we acquire during birth and shortly thereafter. Right. And you've shown that how how the ch- child is delivered makes a big difference, right? Yeah, that's right. So, this is uh, <laughs> this is what we did with the Maria Gloria Dominguez Bello, who's uh, who's, who's now at uh, NYU. And so, so what, what's fascinating there is that in adults, you have these highly differentiated microbiomes in different parts of the body, mm-hmm. uh, like your mouth, your skin, your gut. Uh, there's, there's essentially no overlap in the communities mm-hmm. in those different places. So, um, so in newborns, so these were babies uh, uh, sampled 20 minutes after birth, all of their habitats all over the body uh, basically look the same, rather than the highly differentiated communities in adults. And then, um, and, and then there was this profound effect of delivery mode. So with the vaginally delivered babies, all the body habitats all over the baby, and, uh, and also the meconium, um, looked very much like, uh, like the vaginal microbial right. community, right. and specifically their own mother's vaginal community. Whereas uh, in, in contrast, the ones delivered by C-section, all their habitats look the same, but they look like skin. Hmm. Not specifically their mother's skin, um, but then, uh, then it turns out that uh, mostly it's the fathers who hold them in that hospital oh. first. <laughs> and, uh, wow. you know, uh, th- th- there was um, uh, no, no one had any idea that yeah. uh, swabbing the father's skin might be important, so we hadn't done that at that point. And, and it's a really interesting contribution. Uh, sorry, a really interesting yeah. question. You know, how much of uh, how much of your microbiome comes from your mother, and how much comes from your father? Because uh, at least in things like the uh, like, like the study we did, looking at uh, family members and their dogs, uh, that, that was that was published last year, we saw mm. the contribution of the father uh, seemed to be about as important as the contribution of the mother. Although that was mm. in older children. Do we know if the different microbiomes you acquire by cesarean or natural birth does it matter later on in life? Um, uh, that, that's the key question that yeah. we're trying to figure out at the moment on a number of different projects, and uh, as as are as many other investigators now. Mm-hmm. But we do know that epidemiologically, um, so so I mean the most likely outcome if you're if you're born by C-section is that you'll be fine. But there are there are higher risks of a lot of uh, of, of a lot of things like atopic dermatitis, uh, food allergy. Um, uh, asthma, uh, yeah. so, several other conditions that have been now linked to the microbiome and uh, and into the immune system. So so it seems very plausible. Uh, mechanistically, um, me- mechanistically, it's it's fair to say that the links uh, aren't completely worked out. Yeah. But it's certainly uh, it's certainly something where um, certainly something where it seems very likely that there are uh, lasting health consequences based on what we know currently. So you've done some studies of um, the microbiome in the home. And you've shown relationships between the human and the home and the dog microbiome. Tell us a little bit about that. Sure. Well, well this uh, the, the, this a patchwork of different studies. So, uh, so, so in the family study that I mentioned just before, mm-hmm. uh, we we were primarily interested in um, in how much uh, how much of the microbiome members of the family, including furry members of the family, shared, and uh, what what we were actually interested in primarily. 
uh, was, was whether if you had small children, were those, were those small children a huge factor for microbial sharing among the rest mm -hmm. of the family? And, and so we did the dogs kind of as a control for that. So, so fascinatingly, what we found is uh, if you're a couple uh, living together in the same house, uh, if, if you have a dog, but not if you have a small child, uh, your microbiome comes closer together in, in terms of the similarity to each other. Mm -hmm. And then additionally, you share, share a whole lot of microbes specifically, uh, specifically with your dog. And we also found that having a dog, but again, not having a small child, uh, had a big effect on the diversity of your microbiome. So, yeah. so and that, this is gut microbiome or, or every sample? Um, and, and that we looked at the the gut, the mouth, and the skin. Okay. Um, and then, uh, and then uh, we've done several different studies of, uh, of, of built environments. Most the most recent one is, is the one with Jack Gilbert's lab. Uh, so Simon Lax was the first author on that. It came out in Science a, a, a couple of months ago. Mm -hmm. And so with, with that, what we, with that, what the goal was was to track over time. Um, you know, if you if you move into a house. Uh, what what happens to right. uh, you know as as you're unpacking all your stuff? Do you unpack your microbes all over the house as well, right. or does the house colonize you, or do you both just stay the same, mm -hmm. or do you blend into new, into a new environment? And so so what was what was really cool about that? Uh, so we used this uh, used this technique called Source Tracker, which uh, Dan Knights developed when he was a grad student in my lab. Uh, he's, he's now a faculty member at the University of Minnesota. And uh, what, what it does is at the whole community level, it uses mm -hmm. a Bayesian approach um, where what, what it does is it estimates uh, each community as being made up of a fraction of different types of source communities, taking into account the variation in those source communities using a Dirichlet model. And, um, and so, so, so what, what we could do is we could actually take all these different surfaces like light switches, kitchen floors, and so on, and uh, track how much right. uh, how, how much in the community. <laughs> yeah, so, so it was fascinating. Like we, we found that when, when, when people leave, so, so there were a couple of cases where someone who was in the house initially left for a week and then came back, and we could just see their microbes uh, disappearing hmm. from the various things mm -hmm. that they touched in most cases. Uh, although yeah. it depended somewhat on, on, on you know, who it was and what they'd touched. And, and then things like, uh, there were a lot of things that you'd expect, like the dogs had a lot more contribution to the floor, a lot less contribution to the light switches, which, uh, you know, they can't mm -hmm. reach. Mm -hmm. and, um, one, one, one thing I thought was fascinating that uh, came out of some work I wasn't involved with uh, by uh, Rob Dunn and Noah Ferrer. Uh, so um, so they, they, were, they were doing surveys of different, uh, different surfaces in the household. And, uh, one, and, and I, think, I think the biggest effect uh, on the microbes on your pillowcase is whether or not you have a dog in the house. It wow. doesn't matter at all whether you think the dog sleeps on the pillow uh -huh. or not. Uh, it's, it's still got a huge microbial contribution. So the, the microbes go from the dog to the person and to the pillow. Uh, That's well, the idea. Uh, they, they didn't look at mechanism at all. Yeah. Uh, the, the other possibility is it's just uh, a whole lot of microbes um, on, on little dust particles coming off the yeah, dog. Yeah, floating around. Have you done air sampling of homes, inside homes? Um, Yes, although uh, although much more frequently, what we're doing is we're using uh, Q-tips to swab mm. uh, swab like yeah. the walls and other surfaces, which is um, which is a lot more efficient. Actually, have we looked at household air? We've we've done a number. So so we've we've collaborated on a number of air projects. Although I think I think they've all been outdoor, or they just screen at uh, at Oregon has done some stuff on uh, comparing indoor versus outdoor air in the same buildings. So um, yeah, so 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 it's uh, one one thing that's one thing that's interesting is all those indoor surfaces. Mm. At least they look very much like the human microbiome. So mostly skin contribution, a little bit of oral, and a little bit of fecal. Hmm. Um, uh, but uh, we really are messy, aren't we? We, we really are messy. <laughs> but uh, but what, what's what's fascinating is if you look at uh, if if you look at more um, more open dwellings. Mm -hmm. So this is another project with Maria Maria Gloria Dominguez Bello looking at a development gradient uh, in in the Amazon, ranging from people who are living in very uh, traditional mm -hmm. dwellings to people who are living in air-conditioned units in cities. Um, being, being surrounded in the stew of our own microbes is not what uh, we've done throughout most of human history. And it's probably really only in the last century or two that we've been that restricted mm. in terms of the microbes mm -hmm. that we're exposed to. So if I were to sample this office, it would, rep it would reflect my microbiome probably? Uh, right? Yep, it would mostly reflect your microbiome. There'd be small contributions from all the people who've been in it, mm -hmm. uh, uh, possibly including me by this point. Right. And... Um, uh, and uh, then, then there'd be, uh, you know, there'd be some environmental fungi like Aspergillus and so on that probably you don't have. Right. Uh, but yeah, the, by, by far the the dominant community. Uh, and then, as I when I left and someone else moved in, it would slowly shift to that person's. Yes, exactly. Okay, you've also done some outdoor sampling, right? Uh huh. And have a surprising, maybe not so surprising, that 
most of the microbes in the air outside are from dog dog poop, basically. Oh yeah, well, well that that was uh, <laughs> that that was a project with Noah Ferrer that uh, Bob Bowers, who was a grad student in his lab at the time, led. So so the question so so the one you're referring to, we were looking at uh, we were looking at seasonal patterns in the air mm. microbiome. And uh, ba basically, the question was, what are the contributions? Um, what, what are the contributions at different times of year? So, uh, so we use Source Tracker to do that as well. And um, and so the three main contributions in the summer, uh, which are all about equal, are leaf surfaces and soil and um, and dog feces. Uh, but then the the, the total <laughs> microbial abundance is pretty low, right? But then then in the winter, the issue is that there's no leaves on the trees, yeah, at least yeah. uh, at least in Chicago and Detroit, which were uh, the two that showed this pattern the most clearly. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's no leaves on the trees. Uh, the uh, the soil's all frozen, so it's not volatile, uh, volatilizing right, very much. Right. So by far the dominant contribution at uh, at, at uh, face height is, is dog feces, wow. as you say. And um, yeah, my partner's from Cleveland, and uh, <laughs> uh, that led to some interesting conversations the next of time course, I went back there. Of course, uh, yeah. After that, it, after you're that involved in so out. many projects. It's just we can't even cover them all. We're almost out of time here. But I wanted to ask you about just a few more things. One is you showed some slides today about what has the biggest influence on the gut microbiome. Uh -huh. So what is what is the biggest influence? Um, so, so, so the biggest influence total is whether whether you're a newborn or um, uh, or where you are in, the, in those first three years okay. of life. Uh, that 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 has the largest effect. So that infant development has the largest effect on the gut that we've ever seen. Um, if you're talking about uh, if, if you're talking about uh, adults. The largest effect we've seen is uh, geographic variation on large scales, okay. like Americans versus uh, versus Africans versus versus, um, versus uh, people in different Asian communities okay. and so forth. Uh, and then within the American gut population, um, so that's mostly people in the U.S. Uh, fascinatingly, the largest uh, the largest effect we saw there was the number of different kinds of plants you eat, mm -hmm. um, and <laughs> th th that was a long that was a long way down the list of things that we expected to affect the result. And it affects the results a lot more than, for example, if you say you eat meat or uh, if you say you don't eat meat. Mm -hmm. um, uh, or uh, so. So one one thing that's interesting about that is you know you can perfectly validly be a vegetarian if the vegetables that you eat are Doritos, right? So right, um, right. <laughs> uh, so, so, uh, so yeah. So so there's uh, you know there's there's a tremendous amount of variation within what people who consider themselves omnivores eat, what people who consider themselves vegetarians eat. It's not always uh, you know it's not always sure, kale. Sure. So. Um, yeah, so uh, so the number of types of plants was really important. Mm. Uh, whether or not you had IBD was really important, um, as, as mm. you might expect. Uh, What's the, what has the least effect? Oh, um, well, there's a, a huge number of things where we found no statistically mm -hmm. significant difference. So whether you said you were a vegetarian or an omnivore or a vegan, no statistically significant mm. difference, for example. Interesting. Um, and, and so we think, we think the problem with that is diet variation within each of those categories. Mm -hmm. Okay. You did another study where you followed your own uh, gut microbiome for over a year. I'm uh, still doing it. I probably have today's sample on me somewhere. Every, uh, every yeah. day, right? Uh, every, every day. So uh, so gut, left and right palm, uh, tongue, and then uh, the, then we added uh, forehead in 2012 uh, when we when we went to, so, so a group of us went to Bangladesh to uh, teach, a, teach a metagenomics course at ICDDRB. And um, on the basis of the on, on the basis of the family study, uh, we we added forehead as, a, as an additional mm -hmm. site. So so your your palms are a, a very high diversity site, and your forehead's relatively low diversity. Yeah. But they're relatively different parts of the skin. So have you seen in your own populations as you've traveled around the world and eat different things? Do you see changes reflect, or when you get sick, for example? Uh, yes. Though so, uh, 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 yeah, I, I mean it's it's fascinating how dynamic our microbiomes are. Sure. And uh, what what's what's exciting about that is the potential where instead of just changing them in these undirected ways, if we could figure out what direction we wanted to go in and figure yeah, out how to modify right. it in, in, in a systematic way, uh, it, it could really have tremendous potential for, uh, for improving health. I, I've heard someone speak who had done a similar study. I think yeah. he's at MIT. You probably Eric, Eric Alm. Yep. And he wrote an app so that the people involved could record what they were doing every day easily. Yes, that's right. And, and so, so they recorded they recorded dozens and dozens of variables, and almost none of those variables had any effect whatsoever. Mm. Um, although there were a few that did. So what what uh, so that was uh, Lawrence David and Eric Alm, and uh, uh, and and so yeah, they, they had some really interesting results, like um, like, like uh, going to Thailand and seeing a large right. systematic shift that was then permanent. Of all the microbiome projects you've done, what's your favorite? 
Um, it's it's really uh, it's it's really hard to pick. I mean, <laughs> of uh, course, <laughs> what what, what, what uh, key to the key to doing this sort of diversity of projects is, is having great you know, great collaborators, right. great people in your lab, uh, who are really enthusiastic about applying their, their skills to a lot of different things, um, but also uh, but also being able to develop uh, uh, really good technologies that allow you to sure. uh, apply them to a lot of uh, to a lot of different things, and uh, you know the microbiome is such a vast field that. Um, uh, that very early on, I realised that the only way we were going to be able to answer all these interesting questions was going to be to, uh, to develop better technologies and then make them free and yeah. openly accessible to everyone, uh, and uh, enable the community as a whole to carry out all kinds of uh, all kinds of projects that we'd never have thought of ourselves. And so, so it's just been amazing seeing things like Unifrac and Chime, um, uh, in, in part because they're free and open source and they'll run on anything from your laptop to. Uh, supercomputers to the Amazon EC2, uh, EC2 cloud, um, you know, just this ability to apply them to all kinds of questions, uh, and, and then seeing 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 papers uh, using them come out has just been really exciting and uh, really rewarding. So there's some who believe that everything we do, including our behavior, our appetites, you know, whether we crave chocolate, is all due to our microbiome. So that leads to the question: Do we really have any free will? <laughs> Uh, well, you know, that's something philosophers have been trying to resolve for thousands of years, so uh, I, I don't think we have a, a, a good chance of resolving that in yeah, the last few minutes a, of this But it's uh, an interesting question, right? Because uh, we may be, may be products of the, the communities that are in us. Yeah, well, the, the work we did with um, Andrew Gewitz at uh, Georgia State on the TLR5 knockouts was fascinating, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, in that case, you have mice that are becoming obese because their microbes make them hungry, yep. and you can transmit that community to another mouse that's genetically completely yes. normal and uh, transmit the hunger. Yep. And so, and so, the, uh, so, so the, the fascinating question is, um, is, is that true for a whole range of other behaviors? Right. And, uh, right. and, and the whole gut brain access field has just taken off spectacularly in the last three years. So another project that we didn't touch on is the Earth Microbiome Project, which you're involved in, and sampling many different areas, hundreds of thousands, right? Uh, we've processed about 30,000 samples to date. So, um, uh, yeah, and uh, uh, so, so Jack Gilbert, Janet Jansen, and I are the uh, PIs on the project. And we're still we're still taking samples. So if anyone, uh, like what's, uh, what, what's been amazing about the Earth Microbiome Project, um, essentially, what we do is people who have interesting samples, and, uh, e either uh, e either like the funds or, uh, mm. or the expertise to sequence them. Uh, essentially, what we do is we we try to facilitate that. So, um, so so essentially, people write a very lightweight proposal. It's just a just a paragraph saying what spatial, temporal, or uh, evolutionary question your set of samples addresses. And uh, the typical sets of samples we, uh, we 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 process like between a hundred and a few thousand samples. And, uh, and and so what we do is we run them all through the same sequencing pipeline, uh, analyze them with Chime, uh, mm -hmm. uh, provide the sequences. Um, so so we uh, so we deposit the sequences immediately on sequencing and uh, make them free for everyone. Uh, and uh, the, the, the uh, so so the so the goal of that is to build up this this community resource where we can just figure out what kinds of microbes there are uh, out there in the environment mm -hmm. and uh, what what are the main factors that are affecting them. How'd you like to go to Mars to sample there? Um, well, uh, I'd primarily <laughs> like to go there if I could come back, That's which, right. uh, which is a bit of an issue with some of the current projects. You'd probably love to take some soil back, right? And see what's uh, in there. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, I, I think I think it'd be fascinating. Although I don't think DNA sequencing would be my first choice. I think mm. running it through the mass spec to yeah. uh, try, because it seems uh, not that implausible that you could have uh, you, you could have life based on some nucleic acid other than DNA. Right, or uh, right. perhaps not based on nucleic acid at all. Right. So we've we've just briefly touched on a lot of things, but maybe at some point in the future we can sit down again and go into detail in one or two of your studies. Uh, sure, absolutely. That'll be fun. Are you really excited about the future of all this? Yeah, I, I'm really excited about the future. <laughs> and the, 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 re the reason why is that we're starting to move beyond, uh, like we've been in this pattern discovery phase. Right. So we've found microbes associated with all these different things. Um, what, we're, what we're starting to be able to do with, with metabolomics and with germ-free mice and with uh, huge personal culture collections mm. is, is start to get at the mechanisms underlying those. And uh, the, the idea of not just observing the microbiome, but manipulating it in ways that benefit our health uh, or benefit our planet, uh, I, I think there's just tremendous potential there. Great. Well, I've been speaking with Rob Knight, a professor of the University of Colorado Boulder and soon to be University of California, San Diego. Thanks for joining me today. Uh, thanks again. This episode of TWIM will be found as usual at iTunes 
and also at microbeworld.org slash TWIM. And if you have any questions or comments, we always love to hear them. Send them to us at twim at twiv.tv. I'm Vincent Racaniello at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIM, Chris Kandine and Ray Ortega for their technical help. The music used on TWIM is composed and performed by Ronald Jenkies. You can find his work at ronaldjenkies.com. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology. Microbiology.